Hi there, it's uh, another Sunday evening and uh, it's 8 p.m. UK time and uh, well, I don't know what the time is there where you're watching us, um, but all the same, it's Sunday and it's the Way Show. My name is Wally. Uh, special thanks to my colleague, Yoni, who is out there uh, just behind the scenes, making sure everything is in tip-top shape. So if it's the first time you're watching us, don't forget to subscribe to The Way Show on uh, YouTube. Just subscribe to us, okay? And uh, obviously, have a look at what we've done in the past, okay? And if you like our videos, click that like button, that thumbs up, and um, tell people about us. Tell your families, tell your friends, okay? We always come to you every Sunday at about this time. So today, um, it's uh, we've got we've got someone who is a friend of the show, uh, who's been on the show before, and um, obviously we spoke about some very press, pressing issues, uh, obviously had to do with Africa and the African continent. Today we're still going to be talking about pressing issues uh, pertaining to the African continent, especially in the area of telecoms, okay? So I'm talking about no other person, but Dr. Kobe Mensah. Dr. Kobe Mensah, uh, is a senior um, lecturer, political marketing and communications at the University of Ghana Business School, UGBS. Kobe, it's nice to see you. Hi, it's nice hey. to see you. Great last to see time you. I saw, yeah, last time I saw you was last year. I make you sound like it's been <laughs> ages <laughs> now. I'm telling <laughs> you, man. <laughs> yeah. How's it going? Yeah, it's been good, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, we're making sure that we are safe in yes. the midst of the, the the difficulties that's going on. But we're sure that we all come through this, you know, pandemic very, very safe and even much more stronger. So, that's yeah, it, that's what we're up to. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Kobe. So, Kobe, um, well, today we're talking about... Um, telephony, uh, um, especially with regards to the African market. And um, we're looking at the last 20 years of telephony, marketing, telecoms, whatever you want to call it, uh, in Africa. And it's been a long way. I mean, since 1999, I know for sure in Nigeria, when uh, when the Obasanjo government came in and obviously uh, gave the Nigerian nation um, GSM, as they call it, and mm -hmm. not telephones, GSM. Yeah. So, um, and it, it's, it's been a long road to where we are at the moment. Could you please, in your own words, and obviously with, with your background and obviously with your expertise in telephony, marketing and communications or what have you, chronicle what it's been like um, um, having um, telephony services to sub-Saharan sub African countries, um, mm. where, it, it has, where we started off from to where we are at the moment. Correct. All right, thank you, you know, uh, Wally, uh, for having me. And I think that you rightly put it, I mean, uh, from the obviously late 90s up until 2000s, you know, we have seen a tremendous, you know, uh, changes within the market. I mean, it would interest a lot of people to know that I have actually worked in the industry for close to 10 years, you know, I worked with T-Mobile I served in different, different, you know, departments, including the technical department as, as well, which we used to call it the tech guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but obviously, majority of times I spent in uh, the customer services relationship, you know, uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, department as well. Sometimes I served in the credit, you know, uh, facilities and the credit department. So quite a lot of uh, uh, what you call views, quite a lot of experiences that I have actually gone through, you know, in the last you know period of obviously before I went into my PhD and then went into a, what we call political marketing, which is my area. But you know, I mean, over the years I had had that experience, you know, uh, within the telecom telecom market. Now, uh, as you put it, you know, Africa actually experienced in you know, telephony, you know, obviously mobile telephony, you know, from the early, you know, 2000s, you know, from 1999, you know, up, up onwards. You know, in fact, from 1994, 95, you know, and then up until the early 2000s. Uh, in fact, in Ghana, for example, 
the first network that we we had, you know, uh, apart from the Ghana Telecoms, you know, which initially was the post office, and then it was changed to Ghana Telecom. I mean, the 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 the, the, the unit or the entity was, you know, broken into two, and then we had a Ghana Telecom. Then later on, you know, we had what we call the Mobitel. You know, Mobitel was the first, you know, entity, foreign entity that actually entered, you know, the market at the time. Uh, of course, followed by another, you know, uh, entity called uh, Westel. But uh, in terms of uh, the mobile telephony market, it was Mobitel that actually began uh, the journey. And I'm sure a lot of people have, uh, a lot of Ghanaians, if I should put it, you know, have fond memories of what we used to call Mijina Bonte in America. So that is a local <laughs> Ghanaian language. That actually means that I'm actually talking to you from the outside, you know, so... <laughs> So in the, in, the, in the reference, you know, reference to to a mobile phone because obviously the telephony that we used to have, obviously everybody knows, you know, was you know indoors, you know, or an enclosed place, you know. But then we started having that experience of being able to talk regardless of where you are on the move, etc. So Mobitel actually came up with that particular advert, which was so popular. And it almost became the name of the of the the brand, you know, Mijina Bonte, make us say as as you know a, a lot of people used to. And then what we remember was that it was this massive phones, you know, the 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 block of phones were pretty massive. Uh, especially I think it was mostly, you know, uh, Motorola at the time. Uh, that was the most, you know, uh, what do you call uh, ubiquitous brand. Everybody knew Motorola. And that was the beginning. Obviously, we had Siemens, we had Arcatel, all those brands started coming in later on. But the beginning of the telephony, you know, the mobile telephony market in Africa, or in Ghana, if I should put it, was started off by, you know, Mobitel. Clearly, the service, you know, was pretty much voice, you know, uh, what we know now as internet, text, you know, mm -hmm. all those things that we are talking about never existed. It was yes. just voice, you know, so you have your phone, you make your call, and that's it. Now, roll out the years, and we have so many, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, communications, you know, uh, models that, you know, we, we couldn't even imagine that it will come to that. So as the conversation goes on, I'm sure I can expand on, you know, obviously the consumer market, how it's expanded, the supply market, how it's expanded, you know, and the inclusion of, uh, so to speak, other services, you know, complementary services, you know, uh, and, and so the mobile phone is no longer a, a talking device, but so many other devices, including gaming, mm. and we could yeah. never, never think about it in that way. And that actually speaks to the sophistication of the market. Market starts gradually, and then it explodes. And so, you know, if you are within the commercial space or we are within the business space, you should understand the growth of the market you should understand how technology you know fundamentally transforms market and takes us to a level where we could never imagine mm. so very brilliantly put that uh Kobe. um and, and in 1999 um th there was about just about 10 percent african population mm. at the mobile phone 10 percent yeah and 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 there's been a massive jump now Okay, from that 10% to probably about 70, 80%, if not 90, nearing 90% uh, percent of um, Africans with mobile phone. I mean, even people in, in my village, in, in where I come from in the on, on those state Nigeria, you go there, you have mobile coverage. People, elderly people have mobile phones to can communicate with their, with their sons, their grandchildren, or their daughters, wherever they are. Uh, uh, in Africa, in the in the world, what what would you attribute to that? I mean, why has that jump? Uh, why is that jump so massive from less than ten percent in nineteen ninety nine two thousand, and to about close to ninety percent at, at the moment? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, the the penetration of mobile phone into the African market, you know, could be you know uh, associated with policy changes. You know, most of the African countries, when they were turning to democracy, they had to have, you know, what we call the deregulation, 
you know, policies or, uh, you know, what, you know, you call the marketization, you know, at a time. Obviously, it was one of the conditions, you know, or the preconditions, you know, that the World Bank, you know, would actually put in place mm. for you to be able to access, you know, some facilities, for example. So if we take, for example, Ghana, we realized that in the 1995, or no, 1992, sorry, before the 1992 elections, when Ghana actually turned democratic, you know, uh, in the 1991, uh, there was a huge, you know, economic or socioeconomic changes, all right? The, the PNDC government then had to institute, you know, a liberalized, you know, a, a, a market, you know, a, what do you call policies. That means that they had to deregulate quite a number of state institutions, including the telecommunication you know, sector. So by you know, re removing, so to speak, the hands of government or by removing the hands of the state, if I should put it that way, you know, from the entire you know, market and make sure that the market is actually put into the hands of the market, i.e. introducing privatization into the system, that actually allowed you know greater participation and then of course it allowed investment you know so a huge investment by players that were interested in that industry meant that there could be quality of service all right and then of course coupled with the the growing middle class because obviously the deregulation policy meant that so many other sectors had to be you know, uh, taken from the, the hands of, of state into so many other players' hands. So you see that the banking sectors were deregulated, the telecom sectors were deregulated, obviously educational sector, the private, you know, in, uh, what do you call, players came in. So many other sectors of the economy had to be deregulated. And so there was a gradual buildup of you know, economic sustainability of middle class, you know, uh, uh, what do you call uh, 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 people or middle class Ghanaians or Africans. So very much, you know, could be attributed to policy changes. Of course, you could talk about the role that democracy actually played because if countries were not democratic, then of course the state was much more authoritarian and would be the sole Operator of some of these, you know, uh, 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 socioeconomic, you know, sectors. But of course, as the continent moved into democracy, and as you can see, quite a number of African countries are now democratic. Then, of course, the conditions, the conditions for engagement for them to be part of the committee of, you know, a, a nation state, where that they had to deregulate their market in order that you know the state would not be the only player you know in the market and so it allowed for greater participation it allowed for economic growth it allowed for so many other things and therefore you know we had this boom you know or this you know, huge penetration of ICT in the african society so you would say that much of it was you know uh, the change in policy mm -hmm. and 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 despite all this um it, it's, it's, it all sounds very rosy, very good, especially the way you've explained it. But mm. we've also had challenges with, with regards to uh, um, mm. uh, telecommunications in Africa, um, mm. either issue of um, connectivity being the main main issue. You know, because a recent survey of mobile customers in Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Kenya, and Ivory Coast found out that customers are increasingly dissatisfied with the quality of their mm. telephony services and you see some some um some customers having one to probably four different telephone lines so as uh, in quotes now going from where we've come from okay looking back at where we've come from would you say it is really liberalized one africa and africans two should we be expecting to be where we are at the moment or should we be should we have been far ahead of where we are at the moment in Africa telephony? Well, I think that uh, uh, given the situation that we find ourselves, we probably should have been far ahead. And uh, the reason why I'm saying that is that uh, I remember when I used to be in a, with T-Mobile, there was a time that, you know, 
we had a obviously you know voice was the main product for telecommunication i mean uh, mobile phone companies and then we had sms you know uh, a short you know uh, messaging you know uh, yeah as a short messaging services which you know we had so of course you had voice and then sms you know on the gsm systems now there came a time where we had if you remember uh, we had what we call the mms in the multimedia messaging that mm -hmm. actually came in where you can actually send a, a picture message picture. and a lot of people don't know don't know but those days a picture message you cannot watch it on the phone but you have to go and watch the picture message from a computer a laptop or a, 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 what do you call a pc because you know the phones then were analog and they couldn't actually take that so when somebody sent you a picture message you actually sent a link and then you go onto the internet you put in the link and then you watch the picture now because there was no infrastructure to hold those messages or to to actually hold those backups in the, you got opportunity once to watch the picture and once you watch the picture, it is actually wiped off from the company system. So, <laughs> so, so those days, if you, if you watch your picture message, immediately you watch it. Uh, and there was not, the phones or the systems were not in the position where you can screenshot, you know, uh, that kind of thing. It wasn't that, you know, fashionable those days. So you watch the picture and it's gone, all right? And then, of course, we moved on from the you know, MMS and then we went into video calling. Remember, three network. Yes. Three network was the only network that had video calling. Video, yeah. yeah, they came into the UK, you know, with video call, and that is the only network that had video call. So you could only be on a video call if you're on three network, right? And then, of course, other players realized that. In fact, there were a lot of skepticism about uh, the video call, you know, and there were a lot of. Uh, issues about invasion of privacy, et cetera, and how it was gonna pan out. And I quite remember very well, I think it was, uh, it was uh, 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 this network that had uh, O2. O2 was the one that later on came onto the video call after the three networks, things with O2 or so, and then other networks followed. So in the end, we moved from, uh, you realize that we moved from voice to SMS to MMS, to video call, and now we have exploded, you know, into you know voice over IP, you know, uh, uh, calls, which was ushered in by uh, what we call Skype. If you remember, I, yeah. I quite remember that when I was doing my masters, we were just listening to BBC news, and then there was a uh, there was a, 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 a news item about a, a new company that actually allows phone calls over the internet. So when when voice over IP by Skype came in, it had to, it, it really impacted on the services of mobile phone company because now people could make calls free of charge, and in fact people could also see themselves as well because they had the you know uh, the video you know functionality in that. So if you look at the progression of you know telephony, all right from the West, it had been systematic, you know it had been incremental. Now if you compare that to Africa. We actually leapfrog some of the technologies, you know. We we instantly hit, you know. Africa Africa never experienced MMS at the yeah. time, you know. Mm -hmm. Africa never experienced MMS. In fact, we were just sent right from voice straight into, you know, uh, what do you call the the current, you know, uh, domain of of telephony. All right, and that means that because we leapfrog, we probably could have gone much more faster, you know. Mm -hmm. You see, majority of the investors that were in Africa or that had come to Africa with telephony were actually foreign investors. So you can probably understand where their interest were. You know, their interest was to make money, of course, to, re to recoup, you know, their investment, which were heavy at the time. So the focus on making sure that perhaps the continent could actually live for us was not going to happen because obviously they had to make sure that they get the money that they want and then they could actually invest back you know in their you know uh, homes or in their countries of origin making sure that they could actually come out with new technologies etc for the west before they come into into onto the continent so i think that yes 
if African governments have actually taken keen interest in the industry and had probably worked hand in hand with the private partners or with the foreign you know, direct investors, in order that we can actually develop our own competencies, perhaps we could have had you know, most of these Silicon Valley you know, app development actually taking, uh, taking you know, off from Africa before you know, others. But we didn't actually grow that, you know, we didn't actually have that interest and to grow the market in a dimension or in a way that could actually ensure that Africa gets, you know, most of, you know, the initial, you know, uh, what you call development. And that is why we, we're not, you know, uh, 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 I mean, at the very far end of the, 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 the development. But I think that we had the opportunity to have gone far than what we are. Of course, you can talk about, you know, the mobile money, you know, uh, craze that is actually in Africa where yeah. in transport, which is not the same as, you know, the West because majority of the Western countries have a very good banking system. And so, you know, mobile money is not, you know, but I think that if our government had taken keen interest, we probably could have developed much more powerful product, including medical products, including yeah. medical services, including, of course, financial services were there, Medical services, we're not that, you know, uh, strong, but quite you know, a number of medical services are being, you know, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, distributed across mobile phones, maybe legal services. So many other services could have actually been championed with the penetration of mobile phones if our government had taken keen interest in doing that. Hmm. You know, we're going to talk about the obviously the the, the developments in in mm -hmm. mobile phone industries in in Africa, as mm -hmm. you've mentioned, like in the medical sector, the banking sector, farming sector, agricultural sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're, we're going to take a look into our, and of course esports. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to take a look at, at that uh, um, uh, as we go on, but we're just going to take a quick break, Kobe. And once we come back, so we're going to have a look. My next question would be. And we're just we're just talking about uh, services from telcos now to to the individuals, the customers. Would you say uh, telcos are really focusing more on the pricing, on on recouping the investments than satisfying the customer? So you hold that thought, and when we come back from the from the uh, short break, we're going to talk about that. Okay. So we're taking a, a short break now, uh, viewers, and uh, once we come back, Kobe is still here with us. Are we talking more about telephony market in Africa? Welcome back to the show. It's still the way show. My name is Steve Wally, and uh, we've got Dr. Kobe Mensah uh, with us uh, today. And uh, we've been talking about the telephony marketing uh, business, um, especially zeroing in on Africa in the past 20 years. And uh, before we went on the uh, on the short break, uh, Kobe was talking about um, uh, telcos and, and, and customers. Do you think we will see a situation where tel telcos will, 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 will the emphasize on product-based approach, you know, that obviously of uh, basic services to shift into customer-centric strategy and, you know, the emphasize on, on, on the investments in and, and making money out of the investments 
and then focus on satisfying the customer. I mean, uh, um, here, I mean, uh, in the UK, if I'm not satisfied, say with uh, 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 um, BT, I can go to O2, or I can go to GIFGAF, or what have you. I mean, there's always something there out there that's tailored to my need. Um, I don't want a long contract, okay? I might just want a short contract. In Africa, um, um, the major problem seems to always be the issue of connectivity. Oh, I haven't got a connection, or the connection is bad, uh, and stuff like that. So do you think telcos need to scale back on, you know, we're all out for the, for the money, for the money, for the money, and then focus on the customer itself? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at the successes uh, within the, you know, the telecommunication, you know, industry, and when I say that, I mean both from the supplier side, you know, uh, the entire network. I mean, of uh, if you look at the, the software, you know, providers, the hardware providers, if you look at the, in the complementary, you know, product, product providers, etc., you realize the key to the, the, the successes. Is actually a network, you know, uh, perspective. Right? How do you work with the stakeholders within the industry to ensure that you're providing quality? And if you look at the successes of most of the companies that we talk about, both the network providers and then the handset or the gadget providers, for example, take take Apple, for example. Uh, Apple's success is not necessarily in the handset itself, but in the idea that they could be the designers and the builders of one of the most successful software, you know, uh, platform that you can ever, which is the iOS, all right? Now, before the iOS, what people don't know is that even before iOS or Android, there was Symbian, you know, by, you know, uh, what do you call Nokia. Symbian was the first, you know, uh, so to speak, the operating system that was in the market. Now, that Symbian was actually championed by you know uh, what they call the industry collaborator. I mean the industry players, for example, Nokia was the the lead or the the biggest you know shareholder in Symbian. Of course, they had you know Sony Ericsson or Ericsson. Then you know then obviously Sony. You had Samsung on the Symbian. You had Motorola on the Symbian. Then over time, you know uh, obviously Microsoft came in with you know uh, the operating system which is Windows. And some of the mobile companies actually went on to Windows, you know, and then left the Symbian, you know, platform. Then later on, we had, you know, uh, uh, what do you call iOS, all right? So uh, what do you call Apple came up with iOS, which was only for them because they didn't actually open it up. It wasn't open source. So only Apple actually used in you know, iOS. And then, of course, you know, the ubiquitous, you know, uh, Android which, you know, was a project that was championed by Google. And later on, it was a, a made open source for other companies. I think Samsung was the first to have actually joined Google in, 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 in Android uh, as an open market. And then other players actually joined. Now, the success of you know, Android and iOS, you know, but not of Symbian, was because these two networks actually opened them up for developers to plug in. So you have a huge network of developers that actually work with iOS and a huge network of developers that actually work with, you know, uh, what we call Android. Of course, Symbian also had that character, but developers actually found that it was too difficult to work with. And over time, they fell out of Symbian. And so they concentrated on these two, you know, uh, operating systems or operating softwares. Of course, Windows, you know, still you know, uh, uh, very much, you know, pretty much, you know, uh, a dominant character. But when it comes to the mobile, you know, uh, uh, what do you call mobile market is dominated by these two, you know, uh, uh, what mm -hmm. do you call networks. Remember, we used to also have BlackBerry, you know, yes. BlackBerry has some time, fantastic development. But almost all these companies that actually fell along the way was because of not having a network, you know, approach to the way they they do things. They were dominant, they were you know, the leaders, and they thought the market would be like that for them. But over the years, you realize that the market was far more heading towards shareable platforms, working, working towards you know, network-based, all right? And those smarter companies either integrated backwards or forwards, 
or they integrate it horizontally or vertically. So what I'm actually trying to say is that the players in the market, for you to be able to satisfy the customer, you have to have a network approach, a network perspective of doing this. You have to maybe integrate horizontally and vertically sometimes. In order that you can have a good hold of what it is that is of quality for the customers. Now, my view is that for African telecommunication to satisfy customers, perhaps the telecom giant must start thinking about developing the capacity of startups, all right, young entrepreneurs in IT that can actually develop the fantastic apps that we're seeing. Now, remember the early days of telephony that we are talking about, there were no apps. All those, yeah. you know, the, it was static. I mean, the manufacturer gets the, the, the uh, whatever, uh, the functions of the thing that we use on the phone, and there was no developer, you know, developing an app and putting it on the market for you to download. Now it's a completely different market. We have so many other stakeholders, gaming, you know, news, you know, other markets, you know, all those people developing apps onto the, onto the platforms, all right? So I think that the, the future lies in the telecom companies adopting or investing in young startups to start building African-focused, African-centric, you know, uh, what do you call apps, products, so that they could actually push that onto the platform that we have. We're talking about Android and we're talking about iOS. All these are Western-based, you know, uh, uh, what do you call operating software. We have an African-engineered, you know, operating system, you know, championed by maybe, you know, uh, Tony Omelewu or, you know, Dangote or something. That is very African. You know, this is the kind of thing that I think we can do it. All right, so that those markets could open up for African entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur to develop African softwares, and then for us to have our own kind of versions, you know, which I think we can do. So for me, the telecom firms have to think about how do they, you know, help to develop capacity, you know, so that we can have, you know, something that we could actually relate to, and then we could actually, you know, do to sort of push the industry forward. So the perspective is about networking. The perspective is about building homegrown talent. You know, a lot of startups, a lot of young people are in Africa who can do fantastic stuff. I mean, recently there is this one of these uh, uh, developers in Ghana that has been that has had access to Netflix. All right, that was a fantastic development. But how many of these young entrepreneurs in Africa would have access to Netflix, for example? Quite a lot of them, but only few are getting access to the global platforms. So we need to do something. The telco companies, for them to provide quality services, they should be, they should be mindful that the services that we seek have gone beyond voice. They have gone beyond you know, messaging. They are now into gaming and to other you know, areas of you know, communication. How do we seize the opportunity to make sure that we can compete? That should be critical to them. Hmm. Very, very interesting. You mentioned the issue of probably having a Afrocentric operating system. Mm -hmm. The Chinese obviously have got a COS, yeah, and obviously they've encouraged that um, if, even within their their own uh, uh, um, mobile telephone uh, uh, companies. Would you say having a a, a Afro based uh, uh, um, telephone? That is actually suited for Africa, just like the Chinese have got their one, the COS, and they've got their Huawei's and what have you. Uh, that obviously, uh, operate on the Linux and what have you. If Africa were to, you know, the people you've mentioned just now, and there are numerous of them, uh, uh, to, to say, okay, you know what, we want to invest in, in our African product. Okay, instead of relying on the more expensive. Um, American, British, and Chinese, Chinese one day I'm talking about the Apples, the Sam, Samsung, and what have you. Let's just develop our one. And obviously, we'll be able to now encourage Africans, you know, African small tech guys, startups, to develop apps for our telephone. Would you, is that the way for one? Or should we also be, should we still just be open to what we, we've got in, in, in developed works, you know, uh, dumped on us? 
I mean, uh, well, I think that uh, we should be mindful of two things. I mean, globalization means that we cannot actually detach ourselves from the rest of the world. So we will still be uh, a player in the world. But also, we should also be mindful that we also have peculiarities, all right? And some of these peculiarities are that, you know, there is always that, you know, uh, gatekeeping, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, phenomenon that makes it difficult for African, you know, businesses to go global. Today, we talk about, you know, uh, Dangote, for example. But it hasn't been easy for Dangote to scale. You know, he probably had been doing this for, uh, you know, years now, all right? Can you imagine that if we had our own platforms of market, we had our own uh, market, and I'm happy that we have the AFCTA, you know, going on. But mm. imagine that if we have had that earlier, perhaps Dangote would have actually scaled long ago. Perhaps we would yeah. have had about 10, 20 of Dangotes in the continent, all right? But we do not have, because there are quite a lot of, you know, uh, uh, regional blocks that actually prevent us you know, moving global and scaling, for example. So for me, I think that the way forward is for us to compete globally, but respond locally to our needs. And that means that we have young startups coming, they are developing amazing apps, you know, some educational apps, gaming apps, fashion apps, entertainment apps, so many other apps that the young people are developing, but they do not have the market. Why? Because they cannot have access to the big operating software, the system that we have, they cannot have access to, you know, uh, these, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, global players. So why don't we start developing our own app to also compete globally, all right, but also give opportunity to our young people in order that we can actually scale quickly. So there is nothing stopping us from engaging in the global world, but we must actually engage from the position of strength. And if we can actually engage from the position of strength, then it means we have to start building our own. Because look, the continent is huge. The continent is resourceful. The continent is rich. I mean, we keep saying that, but why are we not competing globally with our own you know, build up systems? It's actually difficult to understand. So for me, I think that the way forward is for us to invest. If governments can actually work with their own private sector, to start giving some headway to our young entrepreneurs, our young, you know, ICT, you know, uh, uh, what do you call brains, to start doing that. And remember that when we start doing this, it is not only on ICT front. I mean, I have quite a number of students in journalism school, right? I teach in journalism school, for example. You have so many people who can write scripts, for example. You know, there are so many fantastic ideas that they can actually put together. I teach in a business school. There are so many marketing, accounting, you know, other professionals that could also bring their uh, expertise into bear or to bear for make to make sure that these businesses can be sustainable. Why don't we provide the opportunity for these young brains to ensure that they could actually do something, you know, massive for the continent and for the continent to actually grow? It is a way forward. We must actually start doing some of these things. And indeed, yeah, of course, we, 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 that, that's obviously the way forward because um, we've seen it in different parts of Africa uh, what we can do with, with telephony. Uh, we've seen the banking system, for example. Uh, now you can, from, from the touch of your uh, uh, mobile, mobile phone, you can send money from, mm -hmm. Af uh, from the UK or probably America to, to, to Africa uh, seamlessly. And obviously, you can do whatever you can, whatever you like, you know. But the issue now is, why is it that it is really quite easy for someone to sit down here and design an app for probably accounting? For example, zero at the moment. It's, it's obviously a, 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 a web, web base. You can also do it on, on telephone, your telephone. But in Africa, you have people with that talent to uh, probably design an app closer, even much better than what they've got here. But they seem to always have a, a, a stone wall or brick wall when uh, uh, designing this and probably putting it on whatever platform they want, probably i.e. Android or iOS. Why is this so? Is it because of what you just said, 
that we need to probably have our operating system, which could obviously cooperate with iOS and Android, or do we just go the Chinese way? Okay, we've got it. We've got the population. Okay, and don't forget, we also have got the population Africans in diaspora who probably would um, want to try out what works for Africa. I think that uh, it's been a good old, you know, the, uh, well, not good, but the old systems of we trusting what is from the West than what is from the African <laughs> continent. You know, I work with young people who actually develop apps, and I can tell you, majority of the times they had been to companies, and myself, I've, I've actually, you know, built software. You know, I designed some softwares myself. And you, you, you go to meetings, and the procurement policy is that, you know, you buy from a certain category of businesses. You know, you buy from a certain company called Microsoft. You buy from a certain company called this. You buy from a certain... So the procurement policy is the number one gatekeeper, all right? It does not allow companies to actually buy from young entrepreneurs in Africa. And sometimes when you think about it, it's so, so, so crazy. All right, that you have competencies within your own region. People can build apps, they can build softwares to uh, at a very cheaper cost. All right, yet the procurement policy is asking some procurement officers to buy softwares amounting to thousands and thousands of dollars and of pounds that even do not work. We have situations in Ghana right now as we speak that government entities have procured softwares from abroad and those softwares are not working. And it's become a public debate. It's become public conversation. So the point is that to what extent do we keep on doing these things that we spend money on things foreign and they don't work? And yet we're talking about you know homegrown policies, homegrown capacities, homegrown, and the crucial thing is that we, we seem to talk about unemployment every day, yet mm -hmm. we don't know that solution to it is right you know, in, in front of us. So for me, I think that governments you know, and people in power, you know, uh, including the private sector, must start thinking about how do we source you know, these things from within. And I'm telling you, the young people in Africa can be doing all these things that we're talking about. If only our people in power would start looking within and making sure that they could actually empower these young people to start doing things for us. I hold the view that, to be very honest, you know, my view is that majority of the problems that we encounter can be solved by technology. All right, I think that majority of the problems that we're so, we, we're facing now could be solved by technology. If only we would want to look within and build the capacity of our young people to develop technological solutions that actually suit our problems, not bringing Microsoft solutions because they won't work. You know? But if we're designing the software, we know how people behave. We know how people sometimes want to cut corners. And because of that, we will actually build that in the design to make sure that it can take care of that. That is what we should do. And, and and just to add to that, um, Microsoft uh, at some point, I think it was in 2019 or if not early 2020, decided to invest over a hundred million dollars into build, opening a, uh, the first development centers in, in the African continent. And obviously to employ uh, over a hundred full-time African developers, which yeah. obviously by 2023 will be 500. You know, it, 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 it says something- And that becomes that their intellectual property. Exactly. It's saying something, but why are our African governments not thinking about moving with the times? Do we always have to have to um, um, rely on our oil, on, 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 on our mineral resources? All these countries of the world are shifting away from this. China, for example, India, they are slowly becoming the next tech giants of the world. What do we need to do? Do we need to do we need to have a change in orientation or probably we need to educate? And I hate using this word because uh, we keep saying we need to educate our African leaders, our African people. But you, they, they are so educated to know how to steal the commonwealth of the nations. 
or they're not educated to know what is good for them, they go to all these countries. They go to China, they go to Dubai, they go to America, they come to the UK, they see how things work. Everything is not technology based. So what do we really need to do to, to, to think, change the psyche? You know, well, I think that what we need to do, first of all, is to start, you know, removing, you know, uh, leaders that are too old, because obviously the orientation is not of the current, you know, generation. So they hardly can see what we are talking about. In most cases, we tend to vote for leaders that are 60, 70 years old, okay. you know, who are not of the times. I mean, if we really want to have change in, 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 in systems, then of course those who mandate the change must actually be able to relate. They must be, you know, uh, 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 people who can actually understand, you know, the contest, you know, of the product and the contest of the product use. Now, if we keep having leaders in positions that are of certain ages, they do not appreciate what we are talking about. They could have lived abroad, they could have studied abroad, but still they cannot relate to the times that we are talking about. If you look at the majority of the, you know, the emerging economies, most of them have young leaders that actually understand the contemporary times and how things could be solved. We have old leaders with old thinking of solutions, with old views, and they want to protect the status quo, which doesn't work. So for me, I think the starting point is that if you are an African and you're going to actually vote, exercise voting, make sure that you're voting for young people. People who, if they get opportunity to contest with bright ideas, that's what you're looking at, all right? Again, companies or businesses that are actually setting up wanting to be much more innovative, et cetera, they should start employing young people. They should start employing people that are very young, that have very agile thinking, agile minds, that have the competency to actually evolve, all right? But not to look at people who have already established because they've established with a system. And so they, there is no incentive to actually change their ways. So for me, <coughs> I think that we should start thinking about changing those who are actually managing the systems to put young people in place, change policies, making sure we are aligning policies to modern times, making sure that we are actually embedding technology into the way we do things, and then things can actually change. What's the, what's the future like for telephony uh, in, in Africa? Now, um, um, uh, we're seeing, again, I'm mentioning the banking system, we're seeing uh, uh, agriculture. I, I noticed there was a, a particular guy that uh, did something about um, a, a, an app for agriculture uh, to develop agriculture in Africa, especially in Nigeria and West Africa. I've seen uh, um, someone I know who is developing an app for healthcare in, in Africa. What's the, what's the limit? Or is it limitless uh, when it comes to telephony and, and, uh, and what it can achieve in the African continent? Yeah, I think that there, uh, quite a lot of um, the, uh, the sectors around us, as you mentioned, you know, are all things that we could actually use in you know, a uh, telecommunication to solve. I mean, currently as we speak, like as you said, you know, there are people who have apps that actually can test soil fertility, you know, can actually give you constant updates on what is happening in your farm. You know, we have apps that people can actually use for telemedicine. You know, people could actually check their um, you know, BPs or, you know, other things, and then send to the, the what do you call it, the medical, you know, uh, 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 professional, you know, the one who's actually taking care of them. So you realize that if we sit down and map out the, the various sections of our lives, all right, talk about corruption, for example, you know, mm. we could actually make use of technology to solve it, all right? And so I think that we, we, we probably want to have you know, a clear idea, I mean, especially when it comes to states and when it comes to, you know, some institutions, why don't you form, you know, a group of technological champions to think about, you know, to what extent can we embed the technology into our way of work? So you are mapping out the various, you know, sections of your work stream and then asking yourself, which part of these can we interface with technology? For example, education, all right? We, as, as my, my team, for example, have built 
in the one of the most compelling customer services software you can ever think of, right? That you could actually have a daily, you know, information of what your customers think are your service quality right there live. No matter how many branches you have, you could have that actually telling you. And it goes on to the nitty gritty of individual staff. So if you have like 20 staff at your workplace, the software will be able to tell the individual staff and their service quality according to what customers are actually saying. And that had always been you know, absorbed by the university, you know, the department. And we used it, we tested it last semester with students and the, the result was amazing, all right? So again, the idea is about how do you map out you know, your entire work stream and then look at which sections can you interface with technology what results are you looking for? And how do you make sure that it is actually productive? You know, in the sense that people do not see it as punitive, but it's, they see it as something that could actually help them, you know, uh, build, you know, their capacity, build their productivity and make sure that the business or the organization succeeds or the country succeeds. So I think that, you know, in every part of our lives, you know, be it agriculture, be it engineering, be it, you know, medicine or medical sector, be it education, so many sites of our, our lives, we could actually apply, you know, uh, mobile tele uh, uh, technology into that field or technology in general into that field. Yeah, I'll just take a quick comment from what one, uh, one of our viewers, who, uh, Bumi Omaho said, um, our leaders uh, know what to do to achieve uh, what is being discussed on this show, but I think for them, it's not a priority as well. Obviously, not a priority. We've already spoken about that. They speak about promotion of local content, but they say prefer current foreign content. I think we all, all, all also definitely did cover that. Um, we talk about the procurement system uh, pathway. Um, we talk about the idea that well, you've got you've got you've got a brilliant idea, but if it's not coming from uh, an established uh, um, platform they know about, then your your file probably will be somewhere uh, in the bin or probably at the bottom of the pile uh, whilst they wait. But what's your message to people out there, especially young ones who are thinking, oh, I've got these bright ideas, I've got this brilliant idea to probably make not just my life, but the life of my fellow uh, human being better but they are in the African continent, they haven't got the support. Uh, uh, they don't know where to go. And um, what, what's your message to, to them if they are watching at the moment? Yeah, for me, I think that the young people should, should venture. Uh, they should not actually you know, uh, lose faith. You know, they, they should make sure that um, they venture into you know, their dreams. If you have an idea of building something and there is no support, you know, find support. I mean, look for like-minded young people who can actually come on board to make sure that they can piece each effort together to make it, you know, work. I mean, there are still businesses or there are still people who are ready to give young people a chance. So you would find that maybe there is a, a maybe a finance company uh, that is a small in size, but the leaders actually understand innovation understand you know uh, what we call technology and believe in young people approach them you know they would give you one business or two gradually if you prove yourself you know worthy of you know being in business they would actually support you so for me people shouldn't actually lose faith that you know we're not getting the big ticket we must start anyway all right get your technology out there get your ideas out there and keep refining it sometimes also the young people because they're not getting access to the big ticket contract, you know, they tend to, to relax and they, they are in, in, in a hurry to make money. You know, you should know that it's a very long journey. You know, it didn't take Dangote a month or two. It took him so many years, you know, to get to where he is. And of course, I'm sure that he himself would say that he's not even, you know, uh, uh, finished yet where he wants to go. Oh, so yeah. I, think that, I think that we we must be adventurous. We must push further and harder, you know, to make sure that we can get our dreams out there. We shouldn't actually uh, be demoralized by the system, no. 
Um, uh, Brandon, uh, we talked a, a little bit about esports and telephony. Uh, a, a few months ago, we had two very young, bright minds come on our show uh, Shayo Wolabi from Nigeria and Kwesi Eiffel from Ghana, who obviously are uh, esports uh, personalities. Um, and uh, funny enough, I was watching uh, CNN about two two days ago and uh, they were featuring on esports in Africa at this the rate it's actually growing in, in Africa, you know, and prior to that, when, when we brought uh, these two uh, bright minds on our show, I actually thought, it, I never really knew about esports, mobile esports, because I know I do esports at home and I use my pads, I use my PS4, PS5, whatever. But yeah, I mean, mobile esports is becoming very popular in Africa now. Yeah, of course, and if you look at the, even the situation that we're in, COVID, actually tells you that, you know, the internet had become, you know, or the digital space had become almost everything. You know, the idea that even when there are no sports or there are no football, you could as well use the digital, you know, a version to ensure that you could entertain yourself is something that is actually catching up with almost everybody because people do not want to actually wait till, you know, uh, the, the actual, you know, events. Now, if you take Formula One, for example, you know, you have a season ending. When the season ends, you have to wait until I think March or so before the season starts. Now, within that period, those who are Formula One crazy, you know, the people can't wait. They want to actually participate, you know. So the whilst the 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 what do you call the the season comes to a close, then you have the digital space, you know, the, the digital version taking over to make sure that they can sustain you know, the, the interest of, uh, what do you call, the, the support base. So eSports, I think that it, it's it's good for both both sides, both the supplier side and then the consumer side, because for the supplier side, can you imagine uh, leaving almost three months, you know, uh, as, as a, what do you call, a season break, you probably could find someone or people can find other interest in other things. Perhaps by the time the season starts, they have grown interest in something else. Remember, we're in a very competitive market. So if somebody actually gets to start, uh, I mean, following maybe an entertainment or something of a different sort, by the time the season starts, they actually grown fond of a, an, another, you know, event or another program. So for the supplier side, esports is good for them because they keep or they can keep sustaining the interest of their followers till the season starts again. And for the consumer side, they also having the opportunity to engage in the sports, you know, uh, as the season actually wraps up and then starts again. So I think that it's it's one of the areas that are actually, you know, that is actually growing. And again, we do not have to wait for this particular sector to grow or to grow Africa. Africa has to plug in to make sure that we also have our own versions of esports, you know. Other than just following, you know, the, the the European and the American or the Asian, you know, versions, we should also take opportunity to make sure that we are building our base alongside the growth of that particular, you know, sector. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Kobe. Always. I mean, when we talk, it's uh, I feel the time should not end, you know. Yeah. But it's unfortunate. Thank you. Only got one hour, and uh, hopefully we, we would call upon you again to talk about. Uh, Sure. Some other important uh, uh, aspect and obviously industry uh, um, we need to talk to to you about, uh, especially regarding the African continent. Thank you so much, Kobe, for coming Anytime. on. This and um, wish you um, all the best. And uh, hopefully, uh, we we get out of COVID very soon. And sure. We we get we get to share probably a drink sometime soon. <laughs> for sure. Stay safe. I used to stay Thank safe, Kobe. Nice talking Thank to you. you. Thank you, Wally. Thank you. Nice talking to you. All right. So, um, yeah, that was uh, Dr. Kobe Mensah. Uh, we've talked about telephony today. Very, very interesting uh, conversation we've had there. Uh, we've looked at the growth of telephony in Africa over the past 20 years. What we need to do to obviously tap into this massive market, very massive market, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars, you know, and we've seen all the big companies investing in Africans. Yeah, bro. Set up, you know, so um, we, what we need to do, we, you know, we, 
and it's obviously got a message uh, for for you out there especially the young ones out there watching and especially if you are of african origin don't give up he said we need to change our, our psyche we need to change our mentality towards technology because that's the way forward that's 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 the world now everything is technology based okay so that's the show for today uh my name remains wale and special thanks to my friend and colleague uh who is behind the show uh yomi uh, we ensuring that you can hear me you can see me and the show went um uh, sh it should go uh please don't forget to subscribe to the show tell someone about this show okay tell your families tell your friends and until next week when i come again uh to present this show at the same time at 8 p.m gmt uh on youtube live uh i just ask you to do one thing please stay safe okay see you on have a very wonderful week bye bye